when you're evaluating a business such as self-storage, uh, you're going in about how much net operating income it's going to throw off at the end of the day. And so you're having to look at maybe an, an asset that uh, is not being operated correctly or the rents aren't high enough or there's some other things that you can make changes to drive higher rents monthly to drive in the end your net operating income higher, which therefore then increases the value of the property. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Jay Bowman is a former buyer of single family rentals, rehabs, and flips, and he has successfully transitioned to self-storage purchases. Jay lives in Kentucky with his wife and two children. Jay, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Sam. Appreciate it. Hey, man, the pleasure's mine. There's three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show in 90 seconds or less. Can you tell me where did you start? Where are you now? And how did you get there? Uh, where did I start? I started here in Louisville, Kentucky. Moved here in 2004. Um, and I've started by buying my first rental property for $11,000 in a really bad area with one tenant. Uh, and I thought, man, this would be great. I'll buy a house and there'll be a tenant in there and uh, he'll pay the rent. And two months later, he moved out. And I learned how to how to be a landlord really, really fast. Yeah. And would you recommend buying uh, $11,000 rentals? To I would not recommend that. It was also the first rental property I ever got rid of. It's, it took me a while, but uh, I took a beating good enough and uh, I sold it for cash as well at the same time. Right, right. Yeah, you you, you have to. I have a story similar to yours uh, in starting out and you go, what, what was I thinking? What yeah. exactly was I thinking? That's <laughs> I think really, really cheap. fascinating. Tell me where uh, where are you now? Uh, we're based out of Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, this is where we've always been. Uh, our, we are, all of my portfolio is, my single family portfolio is here, but our storage portfolio is uh, spread out. We have uh, units or we have facilities in Indiana, Missouri, and uh, currently one under contract in Louisiana. Interesting. Okay. So, right. So just to follow this transition you were in single family. You started off, obviously, you know, in some really small stuff. I'm sure you ran the gamut in single family from, I mean, did you do everything you could possibly do in single family before you gave up on it and said, hey, I'm going into commercial? Sure. I started, uh, like I said, I started buying a small rental and then started wanting to do rehabs as everybody else and their brother did back in, you know, five, six, and seven. I uh, got into that and uh, then bought one and uh, 08 hit and couldn't sell it. So we just turned it into a rental. And from there, just continued the fix and flip, fix and flip rentals, and then just starting acquiring and going from there. Uh, and then after a while, uh, around 2020, uh, the transition to self-storage came available and, uh, after years of construction and heartache and you know, banging your head against a brick wall, we decided to uh, make the transition to self storage. Tell me, what was that? What was that uh, process like? Because a lot of people want to make that jump. They want to say, "Hey, you know, they're just like you and just like where I used to be." They want to say, "Hey, I want to get out of single family, but I don't know how, or I don't have the team, or I don't have the finances, or I don't X Y Z fill in the blank." How did? What were some of the things that you mentally said? I don't maybe yet have the skill set to take that down that, that you kind of had to fill in the gaps on. What, what did that look like for you? Yeah, really the biggest thing is, you know, the acquisitions is very similar. It's all about the only difference is being able to evaluate the property. While you go into a single family, you may say, oh, hey, this is this is a $100,000 house when it's all well and done. Buying it for 50, it needs 20. Oh, there's a $30,000 spread. Right. Easy peasy. That's pretty easy. When you're evaluating a business such as self-storage, uh, you're going in about how much net operating income it's going to throw off at the end of the day. And so you're having to look at maybe an, an asset that uh, is not being operated correctly or the rents aren't high enough or there's some other things that you can make changes to drive higher rents monthly to drive in the end your net operating income higher, which therefore then increases the value of the property. So its evaluation is completely different. And I would recommend that anybody who gets into storage learns how to evaluate those properties Outside of that, we do basic rehab stuff. Same thing as houses. You have paint, you have some fencing, you have things like that. Uh, and then uh, making cold calls and talking to business owners instead of homeowners. It's still the very similar conversation. It's just the operations of the business is different. Right. Talk to me, if you don't mind, take a few minutes and go in depth on property evaluation. You know, when you look at a deal, what are some high level things maybe that you guys look at out of the gate and say, hey, of further interest or pass? And then when you take the next, the, the kind of the second round of underwriting, what does that look like? Can you break down those kind of two phases for me? 
Yeah, sure. So when we begin, we want to have, we want to discover what uh, that seller is, what his motivation is, why he's looking to potentially sell. And so we're talking to him about his, his or her personal situation. Uh, We're wanting, you know, a lot of these people are older people. They bought these facilities in the eighties or nineties when they were 30 years old. Well, today they're 60 and 70 and they're still sweeping out units with a broom and they're still sitting in an office writing physical leases and they're getting really tired of that. So uh, we start talking to them about what their process looks like, what their facilities look like, you know, what's your unit mix? How much are you charging? What's your occupancy? Uh, are you fenced? Do you have automated gates? Do you have a website? And we start to gather that information and we put that into our analysis and then we begin to compare it to what's going on in the, uh, their competitors. Mm-hmm. And what we do is we start with a basic uh basic target and we go, hey, who are the competitors within zero to one miles, then one to three, and then three to five. Rarely we're going to go out of five miles because storage is very, it's just very a local business. Nobody says, I, you know, unless you're in the middle of nowhere, man, I'm going to drive 25 miles to go to this storage facility. You don't have a lot of that. Yeah. So that's our initial underwriting. Uh, and if we can see that there's value to be had there, we are we're more than happy to uh, talk to that seller about making an offer on that. Once we do that, we uh, that second round, we're going to go to a site visit because you can't attend. You can't go visit these things. You know, I'm in Kentucky. I'm not going to drive to Memphis where you are to go see a facility just because I have a conversation with somebody. So we need to get the details first. And then once we have that property uh, under a purchase and sale agreement, we will actually go visit the physical property, do a walkthrough, identify any other issues that we may have and, uh, and move forward from there. Cause we need to be able to put our eyes on that property and, and evaluate it th- uh, physically. Right. Sure. Yeah. You want to make sure that there's no uh, unknowns. Maybe that when, after you're under the purchase sale agreement, when you get there, you might find some things that, that were lurking that weren't disclosed. Uh, but then I guess uh, on top of that, let's, let's ask, cause obviously this is all net operating income driven. That's how you decide. This is how, how much we can pay for the property. How do you determine in a, in an efficient manner, what going rent rates are without surveying the one, three, five mile, every you know, potential competitor in the one, three, five mile radius. Is there a quicker way to do that than just actually getting on and writing them all down on a spreadsheet and figuring out what that looks like? No, <laughs> I keep that. Eating. No, we have, we want to talk to those people. Um, we need to know what these other people are charging and how full they are. So if all of your competitors are hundred percent full and they're bragging about how they're, they haven't raised their rates in the last 10 years and we're, we're just charging ahead. We know that there's room to grow how much room to grow and how high you can raise those rates is another, is a different question. So if somebody has a 10 by 10 for $70 and everybody's charging $70 and everybody's hundred percent full, well, then we know $70 is too low. You know, we want to see roughly anywhere between 87 to 93% occupancy on a unit mix. And so that way, as these people move out, if they have cheaper rates, we want to be able to charge a higher rate per month for that unit size. What that unit, what that is, 75, 80, 85, what that market is willing to bear is, is the risk that you take. So we never like to see that, you know, you have a lot of people who are 90% full and everybody's charging the same rates. There's really no room to run there. You know, unless operationally you are looking to continue to drive, you may drive your clients out. If everybody's charging 80 and then I step in and I go, well, we're going to charge 95, we could easily lose those clients and drop below a threshold that we were really comfortable with. So say that again, if you see that it is 90% full and everyone is charging the same rates, you say that there's no rent growth possible. Is that what you just said? Did I hear that's that? That's what that's that's us. Yeah. So we're going to look at that and go, well, should we go in and should we charge an extra five dollars? Well, if, if somebody else has 10 percent left to fill, we may be pushing some of those people out. I, I, it's usually not everybody's running for the door, but you're always going to have those people. A lot of people just call and shop. And if you have three competitors that are really close by and those are what your comparables are, you need to be you need to proceed with caution in that scenario. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, if, if you're shopping and you're, you know, you're 10 or 15 bucks more a month, 
and they're only 90% full, that means they can just as easily absorb that person who's looking for a place to go. Whereas conversely, if you said, if you shopped and you said that, hey, they're 100% full and they're all charging the same rates, then you say, hey, wait, there's room to grow. Yes, exactly. Because everybody, it's full and they're all just taking waiting lists, waiting for somebody to move out. Well, if we raise $10 and we have 90% of our people stay, we're happy with that. We've increased our revenue pretty dramatically. And then if there's everybody else is still full and they're charging the same rate, we just go up a little bit more, but we're the only ones with units available. And so we're driving the market at that point. Do you, do you just kind of um, test this as in, you know, take a few units and say, okay, we're going to put this out there at 10 bucks more per month and just see what happens. Or how do you, how do you adjust that dynamic pricing or testing model? Sure. The, the, uh, the websites that we use, uh, the software that we use, uh, we are able to set that. And so we will take, depending upon how many units there are, we will take that and say, okay, once we hit a 87% occupancy, we are going to raise the rate of this unit, let's say a $70 unit, 10% to $77. We're going to raise a seven bucks. Oh, but if it fills up a few more units and we hit 93% occupancy, we're going to raise it another 15% because now we're, we're pushing that rate higher. And then once, if that starts to fill, we're going to look at all those people who may be paying 70, but now the market rate is shown to be 85 and we're going to start to move them up to, to the market rate. And maybe we don't raise them up immediately. We do it in a stage over a few months, but we'll go from 70 to 77 or 70 to 80, keeping them there. And then we notice storage has a high sticky factor. And so we may not see a whole lot of people leave and then we'll just push them straight to market and then begin that process all over again. Right. Right. That's really, really intriguing. What is that? What is that conversion ratio or percentage of someone? Maybe they came in at 70. How many of those people that you then raised to 85 actually stick around or, and then how many of them do you find at least renewal end up going somewhere else? You know, that's, it, that would require a lot of, asking why those people are leaving. Um, we don't do that. That's, I mean, when you're, when you've got 300 or 300 units in a facility and everybody's leaving, you know, a lot of times it's just because their usage is done. Right. Um, really, you're going to find a lot of people leave if you buy a value add facility at the very beginning and people are there for the value. They're there for the cheap rates. They're just looking to put grandma's dresser somewhere right. and you were the cheapest in town. And when you step in and you clean up that facility and you go $40 rates going to $70, you're no longer that value. That's, that's not our client anyway. We're not looking for that client. There's another facility a couple miles away that doesn't do as great of a job. It's a little rougher facility. You're like, Hey, they're right down the road. You can head over there, but we're going to replace that $40 person with a $70 person. That that's what we're looking for. When you've already have, when you have people who are operating it poorly, you know, we're going to go in and make value there. Or if you have rates that are really good, maybe it's, maybe the market rate is 60, but they've got a lot of people at 50. It's not really value. They just haven't done their due. They haven't done their job, the operational side in raising the rents to the market because they're always afraid somebody's going to leave. We're happy to invite them to leave because we know somebody else is going to fill them at 10, 15, 20, 25% higher rate. What do you, or how much time do you build in for, we're going to call it the lease up phase or the release phase when you take over a facility? Yeah, so we usually look uh, our market in the facilities where we've had to experience that. It's been about 2.5% a month. Uh, that's a pretty good rule of thumb for us so far. So, and I'm going to be really bad at doing the math here. If we're at 65% occupancy when we take over a facility, we would expect in 10 months to achieve 90%. At 2.5 percent a month, right. that's that's really our that's what we shoot for when we do our pro formas. And so, um, say that like we know this one, it's it's sitting roughly at about 40 to 45 percent occupancy, and we're going to go in. It's going to take us a while to get that thing full, but you have to go in and you have to begin advertising. You have to set up the website. You have to get the uh, Facebook ads out there for these people who are searching for places to put their stuff. And a lot of these older uh, facilities that are run by people who've had them for 30 or 40 years, they're just not doing that. And so we're going to go in and take advantage of that opportunity. 
does it does it concern you when you find a facility that's 40 to 50 percent occupied like how do you know when you buy that that hey i can actually turn this around i mean other than just going hey i think i can or you know i mean what are some things when you look at those facilities and say hey wait there there is unmet demand here and i mean walk me through that 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 would seem sure. kind of intimidating sure so when uh, when we have other competitors surrounding us and we see those competitors are 90 to 100 percent occupied and then we're like, well, wait a second, you know, the old Sesame Street thing, one of these things is not like the other. And we're going, it looks good. It's in the right location and everybody else is full. So what's wrong here? And you have to look at that and wonder why. Well, I mean, it's pretty obvious when they're not answering the phone, there's no website, they're not running ads. You have, you have some management that's just not or owners who are not doing their job and are very hands off or don't care. And so at that point, we are very, very confident that we can go in and increase that occupancy. Got it. Jay, this is awesome. Absolutely awesome. What's been one of the biggest surprises you found personally going from single family into storage? Uh, <laughs> uh, the biggest surprise. That's a really good question. Um, had I known the power of owning a business over owning real estate probably would have made this transition sooner. Mm -hmm. uh, the operational side is um, it, while, while single family, you're still a landlord, you're managing people, your oven is breaking, your, your the lawn needs mowing, all of that. I enjoy the, uh, I, I didn't realize how much I would enjoy the operational side or the investment side of, of actually buying a business that comes with real estate as opposed to just buying, as opposed to just buying real estate itself. Man, that's fantastic. Jay, I've certainly enjoyed this today. Thank you for taking the time here to come on. Next question for you. What is one mistake you can help our listeners avoid and how would you avoid it? Education, you absolutely want to, before you go out buying little bitty facilities, we, we really work in the tertiary markets. We're not in, we're not buying in, in the middle of Louisville. We're not buying in the middle of Memphis. You know, class A facilities are not our thing. We look for tertiary markets, class B facilities, not trash, but it's not super high end. We're looking for value in those markets. And to just go out and start buying that is, it's like, handling a gun. It, you got to be educated. You have to understand what it is that you are actually purchasing. It's not just a, people are going to tell you how passive self-storage investing is. And whoever tells you that does not know what they're talking about. You, it, There is operations to this and you have to understand what that is and how to do that effectively to be able to manage that business. Right. I love that. What is one way you're making the world a better place? You know, when we go in and we buy a facility, uh, we immediately contact um, some charities and we donate a couple of units to them. Uh, sometimes if we don't have a fenced uh, facility, we're also contacting local police departments. We're donating units to them as well. And it's, uh, I'm not going to lie, it serves a double purpose when, you know, you're saying, hey, we'll give you a couple of units if you're happy to drive by once a week and, and do that. But we always want to make sure that, um, we, that we contact those charities and, and we want to make sure that they're, uh, they have a unit or two and, uh, and begin to work with them. Man, that's awesome. I love that. Jay, if our listeners want to get in touch with you or learn more about you, what is the best way to do that? Yeah, you can find, uh, you can find us at go beyond storage.com. That's go beyond storage.com. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter at Jay Bowman and on LinkedIn. Awesome. Jay, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, Sam.